Tiana, can you hear me? For the mic? For some reason, I can't see chat. Maybe I'll move this thing up. Can you hear my voice? Can everybody hear me? Thank you. Oh, yes. Sick. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, I guess we're going to get started soon then. Thank you very much. Can you hear me while I'm all the way over here? Like, do you hear my voice through the microphone or do you hear the rest of the, the room? Through the mic, or do you are you hearing the room? Check chat again. Uh, well, that kind of sucks. I guess my whole microphone thing might not be working out. I wonder if it's recording through both. Like, okay. So I'm going to go all the way, like, in the corner of the room where there's nobody talking, and I'm going to talk in the microphone. And if you can tell me if you can still hear me, that would be awesome. All right, I'm going to go. Hold on. I'm walking away. 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 Do you hear my voice? I'm like really far away from everybody else. You should just be able to hear me. Can you guys hear me? Yes, no, maybe. All right, I'm walking back. Walking back. Walking back. Walking back. Walking back. Walking back. Okay. All right. As long as, like, my voice is relatively clear, that, that is ideal. Okay, cool. All right, I guess just hang out. You know. Okay. Sick. Thank you very much. All right, we'll get started here in a minute. All right. Let me get my shit together. Okay. find something better. I freaking forgot my, uh, what do they call it? The fucking thing, the gimbal. I forgot my gimbal for the phone. Ugh. Maybe. Here, we'll use this. I'm hoping it gets a 
for this purpose. No, I just had this one. Yeah, yeah. He didn't have it. He did another one. I did three. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So this is our largest meeting, and next month we have Beth Dawson, our local herpetologist, should be coming back from Belize. Oh, really? So I don't have a, the day before, so it may be some slides. I don't know, I was working on getting a title. I can't get a title before she goes. And then uh, in May, we have Kaya Hollingsworth doing tea gears. She's a breeder of Dubai. You know him? No, yeah, it'll be tea tonight. Maybe if you'll bring the tea I'll bring, just I'll bring the And um, oh, yeah. after our last uh, carnivorous plant lecture, I got I got to go big and go home. I got a cobra lily. <laughs> I ordered it not from them because they don't have it right now. They're the ones that grow feet, three feet, but they live, their, their roots live in the, the frozen water. So they can't stand the roots to get hot. But I live, I live in the Bay Area, it's not that bad. So if you lived in Alabama, you, they die something really hot. The Bay Area, you can kind of do it. And the guy that was here last week said not to, I could just put the pot like a regular one, but the, the trick is, one of the tricks is to put it in a, a pot of terracotta with sand and plug the hole and then you fill it with water and it becomes like, that's what the Egypt, Egyptians used to refrigerate stuff. You know, they probably dig a, like a pit or something, but the evaporation through the terracotta. I figured, you know what, I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to just put dirt in there. <laughs> and, and, and water around it, you know, so it's got regular soil or potting soil. Then the plants, and I got a five gallon bucket, and I sort of terrace it with a thing and put it in the middle of it. I put my pot there, and I'm like, don't bother me. You know, I've got to wash my hands for as much as I can, you know. And, uh, and uh, we'll see. So they'll bring them in if they get big or sometime. Um, and so we just tested with Kathy. Arnold, she was our test Zoom, so we've got Wi-Fi here, and we connected on Zoom, so if we ever have a speaker that we need to do Zoom, oh. you know, I got the speaker. Yeah. Speakers work, my laptop has its own camera, even though I brought this one, but, um, um, you know, so it, it works, you know, awesome. so we could, we could reject the speaker up here, and then, you know, have questions, just somebody would have to, you know, because I'd be wondering, somebody sitting here would do the sound, and then, if that's somebody like, you know, watching the audience, you know, you know like just the overall. You guys should think about streaming like all the meetings. Like I'm doing this one because I'm here, but like you guys should think about we like. We went to Zoom meetings for a while. Yeah. We wanted to meet in person again. Yeah. So. No, but like, uh, just like upload straight to YouTube or something. That way you can have VODs that people can watch later on. I need to get a camera. I need to do a separate camera. And, yeah. I mean, you can record stuff on Zoom, but that costs a lot of money. Oh, really? Yeah. You have to. That's I'm, wild. So, have you ever done a Zoom meeting and then recorded it and then put it on YouTube? Huh? Y you can screen cap it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I I'm guessing you're doing something that Zoom doesn't want you to do by doing that. But. Well, you have to pay the subscription. Yeah, there's a Really? Fee. Well, you can, if you have, like, a, a PC or a laptop, you can just screen capture the whole screen and just well, root it through something else. Oh, you do? Three yeah. hours, and when it's not like a webinar, there's a webinar one that's, you know, you know, I mean, that's why, you know, I'm not ready to take over the world yet. And I get my secret basement and, you know, and uh, all that. Uh, so we've got a show coming up April 23rd at Mount Madonna. I guess. Um, Mount Madonna? It's, a, it's really? a school up in the hills. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there. I didn't know that there was like, oh, okay, cool. They have like, a, like, they have like their school carnival. It's like Earth Day. Oh. So, is it like, uh, there was one in like, there was one in Palo Alto like a long time ago. Yeah, there was like, a, they're, not doing, they're not doing that anymore? Yeah, yeah, the barn one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did that a few years ago. <laughs> I want to bring over. I just want to. I thought I'd go like a 25 foot python and just leave it. Oh, wait, you just put it in this room. I'll be back at an offer. You know? It's <laughs> a great idea. <laughs> anyway, so our speaker tonight, Eli Castro, uh, local herp legend. He's uh, 
Doug talks on bioactive enclosures. He raises the insects. He has a, a YouTube channel, Heretic. Heretic Nature. Heretic Nature. Nature. I'll, I'll throw, it'll be on the screen later. He also knows about succulents and carnivorous plants and... Jack of all trades here. Yeah, and he has day job and takes care of aquariums. You know, like a dentist office, right? Uh, well, I used to do uh, interior plantscaping, so it would be like uh, we would take care of like plants and aquariums and like really big hotels or bougie apartment buildings okay. and stuff like that. Um, it was cool, but not so much yeah, anymore. I was going to have an arachnid night too, so you know, like Scott's not going to show up for that one. Well, <laughs> you know, well, I had a, my daughter was super terrified when she was a car like that. I said, "For I put her in the street and I closed it." And I turned around and I heard this blood curdling scream and I just thought, God, I put her, like, close her finger in the door because that's how bad it was. But it's like, wait, that would have happened sooner. And I turned around, there was this little radio little cave here. Little cute little cave. Just looking at it, just terrified. So I got a spider, I got a tarantula, and I I let her see it from a distance. So I got her where she could would crawl on me and I sort of tried to be desensitized to it. And then what happened was my wife would have a female friend go by and she Oh, cool. Well, uh, I'll definitely put that up on the screen later. But uh, yeah, so today's talk, I'm going to talk about Papuan pythons, uh, or Papuan pythons if you're from other places. Um, really, really cool snakes, uh, not too often seen in the hobby, uh, mainly because breeding them is, uh, we're, we're getting better at it, but it's been a bit of a challenge for like the last couple decades that they've been around. Um, I think they're really, really, really cool snakes, and uh, I just don't think that they're as well represented in the hobby as could be. Um, you see, like, when you go to reptile shows, you see a lot of the same things, and they're all really, really cool, but this is something that you don't see too often. So, where I got the idea for Papuan pythons, the first time I ever saw one was at the Hamburg Reptile Expo in Pennsylvania. I grew up in Philadelphia. And I would always go to the Hamburg Expo and the Oaks at Reptile Expos. Those were like the main local ones that we would go to. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Reptile Expo that's not in California. And some of the other like less regulated states, they're wild. Like you could walk into a Hamburg or a, an Oaks Reptile Expo with like $600 in your pocket and walk out with a Rhino Viper, like no questions asked. It was wild. Um, you would see all kinds of stuff there. Um, just depends on like who you knew and what you checked out that was under the table. And I went to one when I was like 11 or 12 years old. And I don't know if I, I knew the guy particularly well or who, if he was a friend of a friend, but I saw peeking out from underneath one of the boots, like this big coil, of, like a partially opened, like Rubbermaid tub and went in there and I was like, what's that? And it's this like crazy olive colored python and he brings it out and he lets me hold it. It's a big female, like 12 or 13 feet. And I just thought they were the coolest snakes I'd ever seen. And I'm like, what is this? And he's like, it's a Papuan olive python. And a lot of people have heard of olive pythons, like the ones from Australia. Um, but these are a different species. They've been isolated on Papua New Guinea for a long, long time. And they're really, really unique, um, kind of like a, like a, like a symbolic species, like an apex predator for the island that not a lot of people know about it. So this is where they're from. So I won't get into the politics of, you know, the area, but a little while ago, this island was split into two parts. So originally, so you have Papua New Guinea, and then you have what used to be called Irian Jaya. That's that whole left-hand side. But now most people call it either Indian, uh, Indonesian Papua or West Papua. You know, depends on whatever you want to call it. But they can pretty much be found all the way up in the corner towards Bayak and Manakwari, if you've ever heard of the, the green tree pythons and stuff that are from there. They can be found all the way over there, all the way down across, and all the way across over to, like, the Gulf of Papua. But the thing is, so all of the ones that come into the United States, like, 99% of them are imports. And Papua New Guinea doesn't allow exports. So pretty much all of them come from, uh, from Indonesia, what is technically Indonesia. Um, so pretty much all of them are imports, and weirdly enough, pretty much all the ones that come in are female. 
Like you would like if you were to import a hundred of them, like eighty-five or ninety of them would be female for some reason. Nobody knows why males are just harder to come across. Maybe it's just because of like their behaviors. Maybe it's the hatch rates. I have no idea. Males are just harder to come by. Like um, I started out with one female, and then I looked for pairs for forever. Then I got another female, and I finally found a male after a long, long time. But I'll get into that later. So their habitat, um, they're actually kind of like a variety of habitats. For the most part, though, they're looking for like um, kind of like a scrub type area. They like to hang out in like the lower parts of the forest among like the rotting leaves and stuff. Um, juveniles will climb more, but for the most part, they're on the ground. Um, they're like your typical ambush predator, just like how most pythons are, although they are uh, a little bit more active than most pythons. Um, the average temperature on the island is like about 80 degrees all year round. So that kind of gives you an idea of like the kind of range of temperatures that they like to hang out at. Um, personally at home, you know, the, I have a snake room, you know, as most people do, and it's usually warm. That's usually about enough for them. They don't like it super duper hot. Um, they also like really high humidity. Um, uh, but they will like roam around the island. Sometimes you'll find them in drier places. Sometimes you'll find them in almost like swamps. Um, they'll be in there hunting like crocodiles and stuff like that. Um, or like smaller snakes or even, you know, we'll get into that. So the taxonomy of these things has been it's shifted around for a long, long time. Uh, for a lot, a long time, people thought they were in Liasis, which is with like the Maclots pythons, with the D'Alberts pythons. Um, uh, for a while, they were also in Morelia with the green tree pythons and the carpet pythons. Um, but now they're in their own monotypic genus. Monotypic just means that there's only one member. They're the only species in their genus. Um, and they gave it the name Apodora, which means peeling of the skin. Um, it's an old Greek word, and it kind of denotes to... Uh, if you can kind of see on these pictures, if you're not too far away, um, they have really, really thin skin. Like it's, it's really hard to describe unless you hold like a shed skin or you actually hold the animal. Um, and oftentimes in the wild, you'll see them with like a layer of stuck shed on them because they're like, I almost never get whole complete perfect sheds from them. Even like you'll get one piece, but almost all the time it will rip. It is so thin. It's actually really crazy. And a lot of the times you'll see adult females or even the imports come in and they'll have these discolorations, these battle scars all over them from, you know, whatever they're getting up to in the wild. And you'll even notice like some keepers will have to like worry about how like they take them out or like over what surfaces they keep them on. Like I've, uh, I put her on like a rock one time and she got a scratch from just me pulling her off of the rock and this, the, the, the battle scar is still there from that. It's not even like that much. It really doesn't take much. Um, but their scales are super iridescent when the light hits them in the right place. Um, generally, like at like a 30 degree angle, if it's like full sun. That's why um, a lot of reptile keepers or snake keepers don't keep UV lights in their enclosures. But I like to anyways, just because it makes them look better. Um, they also seem to kind of like it, in my opinion. But um, they look really, really cool when the light hits them just right. And they're also like two-toned, almost kind of like a... Like a it's called counter shading in a lot of animals. Like you'll see like on the top of them is a darker color. And on the sides, they have a side stripe that is kind of like a lighter color. But general, generally, they're like a single kind of olivey color. They can range in how dark or light they are. But we'll get into that. So these guys are really weird. Like just everything about them is kind of weird for a python. Um, if you look at their face, it's almost like really short, almost like a bulldog. Their jaws also can't open as wide as most other snakes. It's an adaptation. Uh, they're mostly reptile eaters. Um, they will eat basically anything they want, but for the most part, they like to eat reptiles. <sighs> so their face, like if you just look at their head, it's really, really short. And on most pythons, especially from New Guinea and that whole region, um, all the pythons from Australia, you'll see on the front of their face, they'll have really, really prominent hit, heat pits, like right on the front of their lips. Apodora have them, but they're like in this little tiny little ridge right here. Those are their only heat pits that they have right there. And the other thing that you may be able to notice by looking at them like this, um, their tongue is like a weird navy blue color, and the inside of their mouth is pitch black, almost like a black mamba. And juveniles, uh, I've never had any of my adults do this, but juveniles, when they're threatened, they'll hiss and they'll open their mouth and it'll be 
jet black with the, the navy blue tongue and they kind of use it as like a de defense mechanism. Um, but almost never do my adults hiss. They're actually like really well-mannered snakes. Like even the ones in the wild, like I've watched documentaries and I've even talked to uh, one of my favorite herpetologists, uh, a guy named Mark O'Shea. I had to talk to him one time and he's been to New Guinea a bunch of times. And he said that these snakes are like just chill. Like he'll go up to like a 16 foot and just like pick it up. It's no big deal. Apparently they don't really care that much just because I guess it's because they're the apex predator there. Really the only thing that eats them is like bigger Papuan pythons and like maybe like very, very large crocodiles and people, but. But you can kind of see uh, another weird thing about them is their eyes almost face forward. Like a lot of pythons almost all the way completely off to the side, but their eyes almost face forward a little bit. Um, I've also noticed with these guys, they're really smart animals and very visually aware of things. They will look you in the eyes and look around and stuff. Um, I've kept a lot of different species of snakes, and just to me, they seem to be a little bit more aware than a lot of the other snakes are. I don't know why that is, but it's just a really cool adaptation that they have. Um, and just their face is really unique looking. And they have these really, really big frontal face scales, which a lot of people see that like, um, it's almost like uh, if you look through the fossil record of snakes, the bigger scales at the front are like a more primitive thing and newer snakes, more, you know, more modern snakes typically have a lot more and smaller scales towards the front of their mouth. Why that is, why they've kept that, I don't know. Maybe it's the isolation on the island. Um, maybe it's just an adaptation for the foods that they eat. More pictures of their face. Uh, but yeah, and uh, they'll also, uh, whenever I take them out, they like to periscope a lot, um, which is basically when they lift their head up real, real high and get a look around, they'll kind of scope out the area. Um, really, really interesting. Um, they're also, uh, uh, if you have snakes, a lot of people know this, but the, uh, the New World snakes, for the most part, their, uh, their right lung is almost gone. It's almost vestigial, and they have one really big left lung, whereas the Old World pythons and stuff, they have two lungs, and they work well together, but like not super duper well. Um, these guys, when, and you'll hear her when I have her out later, if you want to hold her and stuff like that, um, they breathe. You can hear them breathing. It's almost like a whistle or like a wheeze, almost like when I first encountered them, I was like, does this snake have like an RI or something? And it's like, no, like they, they, that's just kind of how they sound when they exhale air really quickly. They, they whistle sometimes. It's really interesting. So another cool thing about them is they can change color. So they can change the color of their skin and their eyes really, really dramatically at times. This is the same snake about like four months apart. Um, generally speaking, I find they dark up a little more during the winter time. And also like uh, females, when they're ovulating, they'll tend to darken up a little bit. And other times they'll kind of fire up almost like if you've ever had crested geckos and stuff. Sometimes they'll just be fired up. They'll look really, really nice and bright. Other times they'll be pitch black, almost jet black. Um, but they usually still maintain that kind of like uh, you can almost see the two shades that they have, like the top shade and then the bottom shade. The top shade will always be a little bit darker than the bottom one. Uh, uh. So their diet, these things eat like anything. Like anything that you will give them, they will eat. I've never had one ever refuse a meal. Um, I typically don't feed my snakes when they're in shed. It's just not something I really do just because like, why bother? Um, it's not worth the risk of them not wanting to eat it. Then you got to either throw it away or refuse the rat. I, I don't like to do it. But I mostly feed them rabbits, chicken, quail. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they, are, they will eat other snakes or other reptiles. They love eating lizards, any other kind of snakes. I, I ask my friends all the time, if you ever have a snake that dies of natural causes, give me. Uh, I will feed it. They love it. Um, and I don't know if it's the next slide, but if anybody here have a ball python or particularly attached to ball pythons? Okay, good. Uh, so they can eat really, really large meals, but the thing is their jaws are really small. And I always thought that was really interesting. And I think that's an adaptation for eating snakes that are almost as big as they are. Um, a lot of the times, like you'll find them in the wild, just like a big ribbon in them just from eating another really, really large snake. Um, and they actually have higher metabolisms than a lot of other pythons their size. I still only feed my adult females about every like six weeks or so. And I also give them fasting breaks every now, now and again. Um, obese animals in captivity is a really, really big problem that not a lot of people talk about. Like 90% of reptiles in captivity are obese 
or if not a little bit overweight, but most of them are obese. And the thing is with reptiles is once you see that they're like fat, fat, it's pretty much already too late. Like they already have filled up all the fat in their liver. And then only after they filled up all the fat in their liver does the subcutaneous fat start to build up. And that's when you're going to have a bad time. So I do recommend with all reptiles, but especially these, to temper your feeding. Uh, definitely, uh, I don't like hard, like, set feeding schedules because people will get locked into them and not, like, look at their, their animal and, like, feel their animal and see what they're actually, like, looking like. Their, their, their body mass, their muscle, like, how much, you know, what's going on, actually feel them. So, yeah, they are ophiophagus. They love snakes. And they actually have, like, a particular technique to catching snakes. I found so uh, they uh, are really really driven by scent and they will kind of sniff up alongside the snake they'll follow them for a little bit and then they will grab them by the back of the head these snakes will eat venomous snakes in the wild and that's kind of an adaptation to avoid um, over in Papua New Guinea they have the Papua and Taipan it's one of the most venomous snakes in the world and these guys will eat them and they basically go up from behind them grab them by the back of the head and they are so strong. These snakes are one of the strongest pythons I've ever encountered for their size. Uh, like, if anybody's ever held, like, an anaconda or something, you'll be like, what? like, even a small one, you'll be like, wow, this snake is really, really strong. These are like those, but for pythons. They are very, very strong animals. And they'll almost pretty much just, like, they don't even, like, with snakes and stuff, they don't even bother with constriction. They just break their necks. It's, it's all that's really ne needed. And another thing, so this is one on the right. Uh, they have a big problem with, uh, well, not a problem, it's what they do. Um, they're cannibals. They will eat each other pretty readily, almost like king snakes and stuff like that. They love to eat snakes, and they will eat each other. Uh, you have to really tread cautiously about having these animals together. Um, what a lot of people do, and what I've done in the past, is have a cage with a divider, and you'll keep them kind of side by side together for a little while. They'll kind of get used to their scent. Another thing you can do is uh, have the female's cage and take a shed from the male, throw it in there for a little while. She gets used to his scent, be like, hey, you know. Um, and we'll get into breeding and stuff a little bit later. Um, but you definitely want to be careful. And in general, I don't recommend housing snakes together long term. Like, throw them together for breeding, but like, if you really want to. But even then, you should definitely supervise your animals. But throwing together like a pair or a trio, I mean, nothing goes bad until it goes bad, you know. That's the way I like to look at it. It's not worth, you know, that right there is like a $1,300 mistake and years of work down the drain, you know. So these are the kind of housing that I like to keep them in. These are big snakes. Um, Marco Shea, uh, I don't, like, he's a her an experienced herpetologist, but very few people are really good at eyeballing stuff and seeing how long they are. He says he saw one in, in Papua New Guinea that was 18 feet long. 18 feet long is huge. That is a really, really big snake. More commonly, they top out around 15 or 16 feet um, for the biggest females. And males get almost as long as females, but they're just not as bulky. They tend to be a lot skinnier. Um, so you definitely want to keep in mind how large these snakes are, and they are quite active. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how big or the bare minimum for your snake cage, but like, just use common sense. You know, This is a big animal. You need a big cage. They also appreciate a climbing bar. Um, and you want to factor into the kind of cage, uh, usually you're going to have to get like a custom made cage or buy from a major cage manufacturer to house one of these, um, or just build your own cage. Um, I like animal plastics, so my go-to vision cages also work pretty well, but these guys tend to outgrow the biggest vision cages and vision cages are kind of expensive. That's another thing. Um, but if you can find one used, um, I think I got this from, uh, this one I have my mails in right now. I got it from, uh, some pet store in like. I, think, I want to say Campbell. I forget what, what it was yeah, called. Pets and More. That's where I got it. They were housing uh, their carpet pythons in there a while back, and I picked it up from them from real cheap. But uh, that'll work out. Um, those of you who know me, I'm really big into bioactive stuff. Um, it's kind of my thing. And I've kept them bioactive for a long time. Um, and it kind of works. Uh, they're really big snakes. They poop a lot. They pee a lot. So you kind of, kind of want to factor that in. Um, they also really like to have a leaf litter floor, and I'm not a working herpetologist. I'm not an expert on these snakes or like snake adaptations in general, but I have a theory as to like their iridescence and stuff and their general behaviors in the wild. I think that the iridescence that they have helps to break up their pattern when they're hiding amongst the leaves and stuff. It kind of looks like dappled light that's coming from the top of the forest. It's kind of a working theory that I have. 
as to why they're so iridescent. Same with the other iridescent snakes, like the D. Alberts pythons, the white lips. Uh, so climate control, um, I kind of went over humidity and temperature a little bit earlier, but I like to have like their general temperature in the cage to be in like the high 70s, low 80s, and then they'll have like a hot spot for digesting food that's at like 88, but not that much higher than that. They really don't like it any warmer. Um, and in fact, like during the winter time, I drop them down. They handle like the 60s, no problem, and they're still active. And they even do this in the wild too. They're pretty active when it's cooler and in higher elevations. Um, you always, 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 like this is a huge mistake that a lot of new reptile keepers especially make, and even, you know, people get complacent, is to not have good thermostats. Like, buy the money, get a good thermostat, um, because you can ruin your whole collection by not having one. Preferably one that's proportional. It doesn't have to be proportional, but those generally tend to be. And what I mean by proportional is um, they, you set them at a temperature, and they vary the wattage to keep it at that temperature constantly, rather than the ones that go on and off. They generally just tend to fail less, and you want one with a fail-safe feature that makes it so that way, if it does fail, it fails off. It doesn't continue to be on and cook your snake. Definitely don't want that. Um, these guys also like really, really high humidity, so I recommend either a mister or a fogger. You can hand mist or hand fog. I don't care what you do, but you know they, they are going to need it, and it definitely takes a lot of the work out of it. I have a whole little system set up. I have them on timers and whatnot. And uh, even if I want, I have a humidity sensor I can hang, hang them up to, but those things need to be calibrated, and it's kind of a pain. Um, but yeah, uh, very hard to get, like, complete sheds on this. That's, like, the most complete one I've ever gotten from her, and it still isn't perfect. It's still missing, like, a little bit of the tail and a little bit of the front of the face. Um, but yeah, that's about as good as you're going to get with these things, and we'll see you later. So their temperament and captivity, uh, I kind of already went over it a little bit. They're really smart, and they're generally very docile. Um, I, all of mine, uh, Pixel is generally the friendliest among people because I've had her the longest, and she's uh, uh, just more used to people. She was in a pet store for a long time. I rescued her from a pet store in Berkeley that is not to be named. Um, uh, they are also uh, really, really strong snakes. So I don't recommend them for kids. Um, just because they are so strong, they can easily overpower somebody who doesn't know what they're doing um, just by accident. Like I've even had sometimes where like uh, you'll pull a snake out and you don't have like quite the leverage you want and it's a little bit awkward and they'll get your arm in a place where like it makes it weird. And if these guys are really strong, they can keep it there and there wouldn't be really be much you could do about it to try and get them off of you. Um, I've never had one show any kind of defensiveness um, I've had near misses with like feeding bites because they are, they, they have a really strong feeding response. Like um, they will try, like I have to be careful if I let her, any of them out and I'll have like, uh, oh, one of them tried to eat, uh, I have this little mat that my cat sits on and one of them tried to eat it because it smells like my cat. Got to be really careful with that. Also, like if you're handling any other kind of snakes in your collection, got to wash your hands and stuff before you handle one of these. Um, they love the scent of any other kind of snakes. They love... Um, I find corn snakes and ball pythons, love them, it's like spaghetti. Um, uh, ch -ch -ch. Yeah, even imports really. Uh, imports are really nice, um, just you got to be careful with imports and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here's some pictures of them with some kids and them doing the kind of periscoping thing. Um, really, really active and inquisitive snakes, always kind of wondering what's going on um, in their environment. Um, find them really, really uh, tolerant of being touched and whatnot, um, not like a lot of other snakes, um, especially like you would never do this with a lot of like wild caughts or long-term captives, but she was a snake that was taken from the wild at like three or four feet long, and she's been friendly since I got her, and she's just as friendly now. Uh, so pretty much all of them are going to be imports. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. Importing reptiles is not for new people um, or for people who don't have the money to be able to treat them. Um, pretty much all wild reptiles are going to have some kind of parasite load. It doesn't always necessarily mean that they're going to get sick from it, um, but you're generally going to want to quarantine your animals and take them to a vet, get a fecal done at the very least um, to make sure that they're clear of everything. Um, there are, like, I've had people teach me how to treat snakes at home, so it's not that difficult for me, but if you've never done it before, definitely take it to an experienced reptile vet to do this. 
Um, there are kind of newer methods nowadays that, like, back in the day, we, uh, like, people used to just, like, soak their animals in ivermectin and stuff like that. We don't do that anymore. Ivermectin pretty much has, to, in order for ivermectin to work on snakes and stuff, it's a really common, like, dewormer from back in the day. But in order for it to work on reptiles, it has to be dosed within basically an inch of their life. So it's, like, not really worth it. You almost got to kill your animal to kill all the parasites. Um, but do not trust, like, so, say you're buying from a wholesaler or an importer, even, like, you know, some guy at a reptile, I suppose, somebody with, you know, reputability, still get your animal tested. You have to do your due diligence because nobody's going to do it for you. Um, every once in a while, you know, you, you trust somebody or whatnot, and you get screwed. So I definitely recommend to get your animals tested. Um, and even, like, even if you have, like, especially if you have a large collection, um, every once in a while, take a random one out that you've even had for a long time, and get a fecal done for it. It's just good keeping. It's not worth losing your whole collection over um, like a couple hundred bucks to do a fecal exam. So uh, definitely tread carefully with these guys breeding. I've told people my stories with these guys. I've attempted breeding several times. Um, the first time I did it, I got a male. I unfortunately lost him. Um, we kept them in a divided like eight foot by two foot cage. So for the breeding season, they were both in like half and half and we kept them together for a while and we introduced them together. There was no signs of her wanting to eat them or anything like that. We had locks and then the next night I came in and I saw her basically trying to kill him and she wound up doing it. She didn't get to eat them though. But you know, eventually, uh, eventually I got another male. Um, I've been trying again. All I've gotten is slugs and, uh, I had one stillborn uh, last year. Uh, it's been a real, real struggle. Although there are people that have had success, especially in Europe. I know a couple of German breeders who have had full clutches, um, but it's a lot of work and the babies generally tend to be a little bit hard to get started. Um, generally you wanna try feeding them something really pungent like fish or frog or something like that to get them going and then you can switch them. And after they get like a few meals in them, they're good to go. I find that's the case with like a lot of baby snakes. Once you get over the hurdle of like the first two or three feedings, they're generally pretty chill. So yeah, uh, in conclusion, I think they're really, really cool snakes, really interesting animals that need a lot more attention. Um, there's no morphs of them that I'm aware of, but I think that's just because like nobody breeds them and there's very few imports. Maybe one day we'll get albino, papuan pythons, but not yet. Um, I really like them in opposed to the Australian olives just because of their general temperament. Australian olives, especially when they're younger, tend to be like really, really nippy and also musk all over you all the time. I've never had that happen with these guys. Um, but yeah, really, really, really cool snakes. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Jeff? What kind of a question is that there's a Lucerana breeder in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. I know the Mm -hmm. There's always a female that killed the male, and the male can resist. And I started thinking about it, and it's like if there's any hint of starvation, mm -hmm. the thing from the male standpoint, by being a meal, meal by taking one of the Oh, you're going with like the Black Widow theory, like the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The female can sequester the sperm for several years, so she, with, with, by her being well fed, then the, his genes can go on more than if she didn't eat them, and maybe she would starve to death. You know what? I mean, so that's. <laughs> you know, that's like totally. I, I think that's completely plausible, especially because of like so few males you see coming out of the yeah, country. Be, like, their, yeah. I yeah. I don't know. Just because like they're such generalists, they'll li literally eat anything. Like they've been documented eating uh, crocodiles up to nine feet long, wombats. Uh, other Papuan pythons, uh, basically anything on the island, but you know, who knows, you know, after, if they're hungry enough and generally it is the females that eat the males just because I feel like a male trying to eat a female would be difficult just because of how, uh, how thick around the females tend generally tend to be. Why? Why? Damn. Uh, ch -ch -ch. anybody else? Questions, questions. All right, I'm going to bring her out then. So here she is. 
Yes, I do. I, uh, so I think I'm retiring Pixel here. I think, you know, uh, I've tried a few times. I don't know if it's her or me, but I've kind of, you know, I've kind of, I'm kind of spent on the idea. I have my other male and my other female lent out to somebody, and uh, they're going to see what they can do with them. Um, but for now, like, she's just going to be a pet. And generally, when it comes to breeding, I like to give my snakes a year off in between. Um, even attempts, even if I don't get anything, I still like to give them a year off from like the whole process of feeding them and then cooling them down and stuff like that. Um, you don't really have to cool these things down, but I've had more success with you know breeding in general by cooling things down. Um, you know, there's evidence that uh, it helps with sperm production better. It helps with uh, follicle production better. So I like to cool them down, but you definitely don't have to. Um, but yeah, this girl is just a pet now, and she's really, really sweet. And I've taken her to a lot of educational meetups and stuff, really good with kids. But in the future, if I get eggs, I will definitely let you guys know. For their, for their size, they're kind of in between a, they're bigger than a retic, but not as thick as a Burmese. Right? Uh, well, retics get really, really long. These guys don't get as long as, yeah, yeah. But like in terms of thickness, yeah, yeah. They're not like super, super bulky like a Burmese, and they're not like, carpet python build either. I think they're like a little bit bulkier than that. Yeah, that's about where I would put them. But this girl is about like 11 feet long, 11 feet, 12 feet, something like that. Um, I've had her for like, I want to say like six years. Um, the place where I got her from was keeping her on like aspen bedding with like no humidity. She had like four or five layers of stuck shed and a respiratory issue that I had to take care of. Was that the place in Berkeley? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, she, uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like causing any kind of drama. Maybe I'll tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure you all know, but I, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, hashing that out for reasons. But, uh, yeah, so care of these guys, especially like, this is a very specialized animal and a lot of people will get them and think that you can keep them like, uh, some of the like Australian species, like, a, a like a, like a carpet python or something. And they definitely need more humidity than a carpet python. Um, but I think that place just didn't, they literally just like, they got the snake and they threw it in there. They didn't do any research at all. Well, I think it's uh, like, they thought that's just how like, with these snakes, since their skin is so thin and they actually shed really often. Like, uh, like she has like, uh, like almost like a five or six weed shed cycle. Like it's almost like on the dot all the time because their skin is so thin. And even when I got her, I got her and I was like, oh, obviously she has one, you know, stuck shed on there. And then I peeled it back and again and again and again. And I'm like, holy crap, this snake hasn't had a proper shed in forever. And it's because it's so thin, it builds up really easily on them. Yeah. yeah. So they're related. They, they thought they were Morelia. That's the type of python. So, yeah. So, uh, Liasis, that's, what was that again? yeah, Liasis is the, uh, the pythons, the white lips, uh, the, those types of things. Also, the, the Australian olive pythons are also Where liases. They, they from that is still up to debate. I mean, I don't think that like herpetologists have the cash to be doing full genome sequences. Otherwise, we would know for all of these animals. Um, I don't think we know exactly where they branched off, but they're definitely like they have solidified. I think the last paper came out in 2020, and they're like they're definitely not liases. They're definitely not Morelia. So. so there's an olive python in Australia, an yes. olive python in Papua New Guinea, and they're in different genuses? Totally different genuses, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The Australian olives are liasis. These have their own. It's Apodora. And if you look, I should have put a picture of the Australian olives in there. Um, but they have the same general, like, skin tone. They're not as iridescent, and their snouts are much longer, like a, a more typical python kind of look to them. Yeah, uh, uh, no, like they, like, really, you know what, I'll look one up. I'm like, I'll, I'll just look at a picture. Screw it. Yeah, the white lip, it kind of looks like it. I mean, the iridescence is not as bright as the white lip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just look one up real quick. Yeah, white lips are really cool. They got a reputation of being tiny. Uh, so I've had both types. So there's the, so there's the northern and the southern white lips. Um, generally, in my experience, the southern ones, they get bigger and they're a lot more docile than the northerns. The northerns are... Uh, the ones that are less, the southerns. The southerns are going to go for a lot more money, generally. That's why I have. There's the rare one, and that one is more docile, you 
Yeah, yeah the seven white lips. So. Yeah, you see how like the the front of their face is like, yeah, yeah. You can see more pits, and it's also a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. These guys eat more mammals in the wild. They uh, they also eat crocodiles and stuff too. But that's like you can kind of see why the original people who discover them would be like, oh, olive python, olive python. New Guinea's really close to Australia. Huh? Uh, I know, I know. Well, nowadays they're just calling these Papuan pythons, just Papuan python. You know, just, you know, instead of Papuan olive or anything. Um, people used to call them the Irian python, but Irian jaya isn't a thing anymore. So, I don't know. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So Irian Jaya was its own thing. It had, and then it was kind of enveloped into the rest of Indonesia. Now it's called West Papua or Papuan Indonesia. Yeah, I don't, I don't pretend to know about all the politics and the world history of that, but oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Move up here. She will turn into a belt or a sash. Um, they hold on real, real tight, um, yeah, especially cool. because, yeah, yeah. I find that adults, they're not real big on like climbing or anything like that. So generally speaking, when they're up high, they, they grip a lot harder than they really have to. I'm like, you don't need to like, you know, I got you. You don't need to like hurt me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Where did this come from? Yeah, that was, a, that was a minute ago. That's a blast from the past. But, uh, yeah, really, really cool snakes, please. Can I have my hand back? Thank you. <laughs> oh, she'll also, like, loop into the belts and stuff. Yeah. You know? Okay, cool. We're good. So, yeah, that's the presentation. If anybody wants to come up and pet her or look at her, you're more than welcome. Here, you can... See, this is what I deal with. What's up, Hadiah? Hi, Aisha. The presentation's over, but if you want to come up and pat her, you can come. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> yeah, the, the British people, they call them Papuan pythons. Yeah. You want to pet her? You can if you want. Long tail. Long tail for a female. Sure. Oh. Uh, she, yeah, she ate like a week ago, so she's probably due for a poop at some okay. point. Hey, I've been informed. Thank you, uh, hopefully. All right, that's it for the stream. Bye bye. Yeah, uh, I bet.